and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. You know, when scripture repeatedly says that Old Testament saints longed for our day, you know, they weren't talking about our technology our large sanctuaries, our video capabilities, our, our sound systems, and, and the amazing things that we can do with, with lights and production. It was the promises of God in Jesus Christ, the filling of the Holy Spirit that Old Testament saints longed for to taste and to see what you and I have. We've been walking through these last several weeks since Easter, and we've been looking at the Holy Spirit. Began with John 14, where Jesus was leaving his disciples, but he turned to them in assurance and confidence and said to them, you know, it's better that I go away. Amen. It is better for you that I go away because the Holy Spirit inside of you is better than Jesus right beside you. Think about that. And then last week, we looked at this, this incredible, really, mystery, this, this unfolding that you see in the New Testament where it says, because we are spirit-indwelt people, that God has given us grace gifts or spiritual gifts where the Spirit shows up in different areas of our lives where, where it's in these manifestations, these giftings where the Spirit shines through in unique, special ways, different in each one of us, where other people experience God through us and we experience the Holy Spirit through what we call spiritual giftings. And now, this morning, you see, last week we, we walked through something. We just touched on this idea, but this morning I want to camp out on this idea, and that is Scripture's command to us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so remember from last time that every born-again believer has the permanent, full, indwelling Holy Spirit, okay? That, that when Bible, uh, the, the Bible speaks in fixed categories that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that you are a new creation, that you are alive from the dead. You were dead, and now you're alive. Amen. Fixed category. But the scripture also speaks in terms of being continually filled with the Spirit because your batteries run down. And just like you wake up every day and you need more food and nourishment, your soul wakes up and needs the same. And you will either feast on everything that the world offers or you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, so that's the pool I want us to swim in this morning. This command from Scripture to be continually filled with the Spirit. In Ephesians 5, turn with me in your Bible to Ephesians 5, Paul is going to point out to us where this Spirit promises to meet you. Do you want to be filled with the Spirit? That there are promised meeting spots that the Spirit will meet us. Imagine with me you own a Tesla. You would want to know where all the charging stations are all around town so that you can recharge your batteries, so that you can fill up. And so too, in a most helpful, practical way, Paul is going to highlight special meeting spots where the Spirit promises to meet with us in 
extraordinary ways. But there's really something important that I need you to understand before we get there. So I need you to listen to what I'm about to say. That these meeting spots that I'm going to point out, that Paul points out, that does not mean that just by going to those spots, you will be filled by the Spirit. Because religious practice does not mean that you are connecting with God. Okay, The Pharisees prove that, right? You can sing all the songs you want to and not be filled by the Spirit. So do not hear me say that. To go back to the Tesla analogy, just going to a charging station is not how you charge your batteries. The how is, well, you got to plug in, right? Just being around the station doesn't uh, do you a lick of good, right? So the how does one fill up with the Spirit, do not miss this, the how you fill up with the Spirit is by faith. It's always by faith, by believing the gospel, the promises of God. It's why the Spirit can meet you and will meet you anywhere. It is always by faith. Check this out, Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace by believing, in your believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit is always tied to faith. Believing the promises of God in Jesus Christ, that is where he meets you. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So how does one fill up with the Spirit? By faith, by believing. But what we're going to focus on this morning is that the Spirit has promised meeting spots, okay? Moments of special connectivity where faith is stirred up and where the Spirit promises to fill us up in extraordinary ways. And the focus this morning is going to be on our gathering together, okay? Next week, Garrett is gonna look at individual spots where the Spirit promises to meet you. Okay, so the Spirit will meet you individually, but this morning, because really the text focuses on this, this is where Paul focuses, we're going to look at when we gather together, there are special meeting locations that the Spirit wants to fill us up. So listen with me as I read Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 15 through 21. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, verses 18 through 21 is one sentence in the Greek, and the one imperative is be filled with the Spirit. Everything I'm going to read after that modifies being filled with the Spirit. All right, so into verse 18, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, Always giving thanks for, the, uh, for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we have gathered together this morning, as we remember your faithfulness and your promises and your character God, we have come to your word to hear a word from you through the power of the Spirit that you would fill us up and that you would help us to think rightly and to understand what it means for us to walk out the Christian life being filled by the Spirit 
walking in a way that honors and glorifies you. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here in Ephesians 5, Paul is writing to born again, Holy Spirit filled, sealed believers, okay? He spent three chapters highlighting that you and I have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. That's why it's fascinating when you get to the latter part of the letter that he says things like in verse six, let no one deceive you. Or here in verse 16, you know, the days are evil. Because all of that assumes that you can be deceived or fall victim to an evil age. In fact, it's why Paul is constantly charging us Because even though you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can live as unwise. You can go back to your old lifestyle. You can live foolishly. In fact, you can waste your life. I had a college friend call me a few years back. He was uh, a roommate of mine in college, and he... He had, but God used him and me in a very special, unique way. When, when I was in college and God radically grabbed a hold of me in just 180, complete surrender and began to follow after him, he was my roommate. And the Lord did the same to him in his life. Now, long story short, we ended up going separate directions. I got called to ministry. He went into business. And if I'm honest with you, there is one thing that I always saw in him, and that is he had a propensity to love the material things of the world and to love money. Well, a few years ago, he called me out of the blue. And we were playing a little catch up, and he began to talk to me. He began to tell me uh, about all of his accomplishments, things that he had, had achieved in life at a young age. He was about 39 at the time, and uh, he, he had achieved millions in business. He, he was an owner of many different businesses. In fact, he had just received an award for top 40 businessmen under 40 in Dallas Magazine. He was recognized all through the city of Dallas, making millions, the top 40 people that you need to know under the age of 40. And I was congratulating him and probably in the back of my mind thinking, wow, what have I done with my life? And he (laughs) pauses for a moment in the middle of me going, hey man, that's great for you. And just said this statement, Jason, I feel like I'm wasting my life. You see, he knew Jesus, but also knew that he was chasing after the wrong things. So it's something that we all know as believers. But you need me to, you need to hear me say it this morning, and that is you can waste your life. And Paul gives a lot of instruction, and you can, you can read it in a lot of details, but he has one overarching truth to how a believer does not waste their life. And his climactic answer, if you want to walk worthy in the midst of this evil age, is you must be continually filled by the Spirit of God. Keep on being filled. And interestingly here, as an illustration, he contrasts being filled with the Spirit with getting drunk. So think about this with me for a moment. What is it about alcohol that gives someone the courage to shamelessly belt out that karaoke song? Why do people turn to alcohol? For happy hour because they want to be happy. They long to be carefree, to have their burdens lifted, to forget their troubles. And for just a moment, they're able to lay down their anxiety and fear for a temporary childlike freedom, only to pick it right back up again. 
And the mounting tragedy for so many, even Christians, is that it is their only way to cope with life. The reality is that such behavior dishonors God. Why? Because he offers a better way. He offers himself. Be continually filled with the Spirit. He offers joy and delight for your soul in him. His burden is easy and his yoke is light. Cast all of your anxiety upon him. Your financial trouble, your relationship troubles, all of your burdens, and he will give you a peace that is greater than your circumstances. You say, yeah, pastor, be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? I mean, I know how to drink a drink and get drunk, but I can't pour in the Spirit. The reality is is he moves as he wishes. He is not some force uh, that I can summon. I can't train him. And yet, the Bible does command, it's actually a passive command to be filled with the Spirit. So do I just sit around and wait for a feeling? You ever struggle with this? Am I to write down all of my dreams? Go on a pilgrimage. If I fast all day and read my Bible, then will the Spirit fill me? Now, what's so helpful about Paul here in Ephesians 5 is he gives us four things when done in faith become meeting spots to be filled by the Spirit of God. And the context for all four of these things is when we gather together. Again, Garrett's going to address individual spots where the Spirit meets you. But here, let's check out, let's turn to the Scripture that when we gather together as the body of Christ, he promises to fill us up. Look at verse 19. So the first thing, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then the second one, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now, if it's okay, I'd like to start with the second one, making uh, singing and making melody uh, with your heart to the Lord, and then we'll come back to the first. All over the world, this morning, Christians will gather together in homes, in basements, some of them outside, Others in large sanctuaries like this one and sing songs of praise to Jesus. All over the world. Have you ever paused and asked the question, what is so important about singing worship? Catch this. When we sing songs together, what are we doing? First of all, we sing about God's character. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. We sing about God's promises. We did this morning. All your promises are yes and you are faithful and all your promises are true. And we sing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. All of those things, listen, they stir up faith about who God is and what he has done for you. When we sing, we are stirring up faith. How many times have you come in here worried, tired, anxious about life, filled with doubts and confusion, not even wanting to be here? And then suddenly, when surrounded by the singing of the saints, that singing lifted your head. And suddenly you could see Jesus again, right? Your salvation was stirred up fresh and new with life. 
And, and, and you felt alive again. You felt like you had strength to make it through another day. You know what Paul calls that? Being filled with the Spirit. Amen. Right? Being filled with the Spirit of God. That as we sing in faith, remember it is always by faith. It's not just the singing, it's in faith, but we are reminded of who God is, that the Spirit lightens our burdens. He fills us with joy. He assures us that he is going to fight our battles. Do you remember a sermon I preached? Uh, it was, it's been some time about Jehoshaphat. I know you're thinking, Pastor, of course, we remember every one of your sermons. Remember the second Chronicles chapter 20. Okay, Jehoshaphat is king, and suddenly he wakes up to the news that there is a multitude, a million man army that is right on the edge of Jerusalem. They are unprepared and they are completely outmanned. And this is a, a critical moment because he gathers the people of God together and they begin to pray and they begin to fast. And as they pray, they cry out. And they say, God, you said, you said that if we called upon your name, that, that if, if we look towards your temple, that you would hear us and that you would fight for us. Well, a prophet, the man of God rises up. He says, God has heard you. And so they get out and they get ready for a battle the next day and they stick the choir and the orchestra on the front, okay, in the front of the battle. And they begin to go out and march with the choir singing and the orchestra blowing their horns and the scripture says that the Holy Spirit of God went before them and confused the enemy so that the time that they got around the end, everyone had killed themselves in their confusion and all the people of God had to do was come in and pick up the plunder. Amen. Church, when you and I gather together on a, in this room, look around, when we sing the praises and promises of God, the Holy Spirit is filling up faith, giving courage, reminding us that you can stand back up and face the fears, anxiety, the struggles of the, you can fill back up that, that Jesus is fighting the battle for you. Filled up with faith. It's a magnificent thing. Think about this. The courage to stand back up. And let me just pause and say this. I want to thank Mark and the choir for what occurs here on Sunday mornings to lead us to the throne room of God. Amen. We're not perfect, but we do a lot of things right that if I'm honest, I think our culture tends to miss. Because when we sing, on, it's not a performance. It's not us sitting back and going, you know what? She's really good. It's about us coming before the throne of Jesus. That's how you know if worship is good. If you leave there and you're like, oh my goodness, our Savior is so good. He's so good. And it's not about personal preference. It's not about this is my favorite song or that. It's that God meets with us and we experience the presence of God in an incredible, unique, powerful way when we gather together. It's awesome, guys. In fact, a couple weeks ago, I really sensed the Spirit kind of showing me an even newer idea in terms of our worship. And I want to implement this over the next several weeks. Because there's a, a freedom, because God is moving, I honestly think during those first four songs that we sing that we need people stationed around the sanctuary who are able to pray with people and just kind of meet them where they are. That how important it is for us 
to be about prayer. I know, I know in the final song, there's only so much time. And if you're in the balcony, you're like, I'm not getting down there. I'm not going to pray with someone. This song will be over by the time I get down there, right? But if, if the Spirit is filling us up in an incredible, unique, powerful way, we need to have the freedom Right, because because you may come in and, and there have been times where I'm like this. You come in and I just need to pray with someone. I just need to sit at the altar and just sense God's nearness that He is there, or or cast my burdens down and have someone who can pray with me. So I want us to continue as a congregation to press into this truth, and it may stretch you a little bit, but the reality is, is we need to value even our prayer during our corporate worship time. All right, so that's the first one, singing and making melody with God in our hearts. Now, number two, so back to the first one, sorry if that's confusing, is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So now that I've explained what we do in singing, right? We remember God's character, his promises. We sing the good news of the gospel. We are also instructed to speak to one another in the same way. Speak to one another in the same way. Now, there are a number of passages in the New Testament letters that are thought to be the earliest hymns of the church, Okay, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Colossians 1, 15 through 20, and a number of others. These hymns, when you study them, are central truths of the Christian faith. All right, so you get what I'm saying here. He's not saying that Christians should live life as if they're in a musical. All right, that makes sense. We, we don't walk up and sing, hello, good day, to each other. You're not in a musical. Rather, this is speaking the same truths that we sing. Now, when we sing and we gather together and sing, it is vertical. But now when we speak, it's those same truths on the horizontal level to each other. It's why I think that our service needs more time of prayer to speak and to pray the truths of God over one another. But this gathering is, is not the, the only thing this is talking about. Rather, on Sunday mornings, right, it's our organized growth groups. It's also any time that we meet together just to talk and pray. So think about this. The Spirit powerfully fills us up when we speak over one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That is in our conversations and praying the truth of God over one another. This is how we don't waste our lives. So what this means is that our conversations have to go beyond fine and the cowboys. How are you? I'm fine, right? So we walk amongst each other. We see each other. I'm fine. How's the weather? How are the cowboys doing? We have to get real with one another so that we can speak truth and pray over each other. Guys, it's why you have a deacon and it's why you have a growth group. It's also why growth groups need time for prayer and must be interactive, right? Not 100% lecture style so that the people of God can fill up with the Holy Spirit by speaking the truths of God into your life because you may show up and you're discouraged this day or you have this issue and you need a truth from, you need someone to pray over you to remember that God's promises are true in your life today. Thirdly, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the third charging station to get filled up by the Spirit is to give thanks in every situation, to lead your heart to thankfulness. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. You know, Paul said those words while in prison, awaiting trial for his life. I mean, someone who suffered in greater ways than you and I could ever imagine. So 
So when he says something, it carries weight. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Always giving thanks for every circumstance in Jesus' name. Because as you and I pause to take inventory of all the blessings that God has given to us, your heart fills up with thanksgiving. And now here's the incredible picture and promise that even as you consider your trials, your hurts, your setbacks, your defeats, the Holy Spirit promises to meet you and to fill you up as you lead your heart in thankfulness. He promises to meet you there and to fill you up and to remind, quicken your heart to the promises of God. He promises to use all things for your good, filling you up, giving you joy in the place of grief, lifting your burden and giving you peace. John Newton had a saying that I think is incredible. Because when you look at a Christian who suffers in the Holy Spirit, he says, as like the burning bush was to Moses. You see, Moses came over looking and wondering, going, why is that bush not burned up? And when a Christian suffers in the power of the Holy Spirit and gives thanks in those certain, the lost world will come up and look and go, why is she not burned up? It's the power of God and the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at this picture. Every time we do an Explore FBC, we, uh, we talk about different stories. And there's one we talk about, it's Kathy's story. This is the journey of a growth group that had one of their members uh, get cancer and even pass away. But during that journey, as the growth group surrounded her and prayed over her, the Spirit even worked and, and poured out faithfulness in the midst of difficult circumstances. That's what we're talking about. The Spirit filling you up in all circumstances due to thankfulness. All right, the fourth spot that the Spirit promises to fill you up, verse 21, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This fourth one, let's just be honest. It's shocking. I don't particularly like it, so could we all agree? Let's just cross that part out of our Bible. We'll pretend it's not there, and we'll just move forward. All right, obviously, just kidding, right? This fourth one is tough. I want you to think about it. Look at what it says. The fourth meeting spot that the Spirit promises to fill you up in your life is when you are subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So plainly, this means allowing other believers to hold you accountable for sin in your life. So if the first speaking is encouragement of God's promises and God's goodness, the second speaking is in regards of being able to say to you, stop that. That's not good for you. You cannot walk with Jesus and continue to do that. Because here's the deal. You don't just need encouragement. You also need accountability. Now think of the level of trust and relationship that is required in order to be able to walk this out in a healthy way. Personally, I have two men that I meet with weekly who are able to pray with me and to speak into my life. They ask me at least four questions every week. How's your marriage? How's your parenting, your relationship with your kids? How's your purity? And how's your walk, your personal walk with Jesus? And they pray over me, and, and there are times when they correct me. And it may not feel good in that moment, but the scripture promises that the Spirit is filling me up in those moments. 
Now think about this, because I also want you to know, this is not something that you can opt in or out of, that you can say, you know what, I really like those first three. I'm just going to choose to meet the Spirit in those, and I'm going to avoid that fourth one, just kind of push that to the side. Because the reality is, is the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in your life is that you meet God in all of these locations. If you will not receive correction or if you keep everyone an arm's length away, that is strong evidence of you resisting the Holy Spirit in your life. And if you don't like it, don't get mad at me. It's just what the Bible says. Now, I once heard Tony Evans give a, tell a story about Niagara Falls. Anyone here ever been to Niagara Falls? I hear it's incredible. One of my bucket list things to do. Now, as you can imagine, you can hear the roar of the falls from 30 miles away. Okay, that constant permeating sound of water falling 325 feet. Now, there are those who will only experience the falls from a distance, only by sound. But the closer you get to the falls, you can start to feel the mist and the moisture in the air. Your face will begin to get damp. And for those of you that have hair, apparently it messes up, right? And there are those who will experience the falls at this level, looking over simply damp. But there's a third category for experiencing the falls. That is, you can get on a boat tour at the bottom of the falls. But you better get ready, because if you get on that boat, you better gear up, because you are about to get soaked. Everything is going to get completely, you are going to get immersed in the falls. Some of you here this morning have only heard about Jesus, and you are listening from a distance. Your experience of God is detached, and you keep looking for joy in all the wrong places, and you've never found true rest for your souls. So hear me this morning. God sent his son to die for you so that you could know him, so that you could know God personally and intimately. And you hear the invitation right now. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good, that he is the joy, that he can fill your soul like no other. He created you. He knows every, he can fill you. Others of you this morning, you are saved. But if I'm honest, you have a weak faith. Your experience of God is only a mist. You've gone back to so much of your old lifestyle that it's difficult to tell if you are even wet. You are easily deceived by the world because of your love for sin. It's like you're standing at the top of the falls and you are fearful of what Jesus might ask you to let go of in order that he might fill you. I don't wanna waste my life. I don't wanna waste my life. I want the boat tour at the bottom of the fall. I want to experience the love of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit in a transformative way where he continues to overflow in my life. I don't want to waste my life. 
I don't want to be deceived by the passions of this world and come to the end and have Jesus say, look at all that I wanted to give you, but you were unwilling. I don't want to waste my life. Personally, and even corporately in this church, Guys, let's fill up with the Holy Spirit where he has promised us in our worship, in our speaking one to another with thankfulness and even allowing accountability, being subject to one another. Because he has promised when we go to those spots in faith, he will fill us. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father. God, we come to you right now. Laying down. Father, laying down all the temporary measures from this world that we so easily cling to and are satisfied with, that is not you, that is preventing us from filling up on you. You are the one who gives joy. You are the one who gives peace. You are the one who gives courage to walk out our days in a worthy manner, God. Fill us. The Old Testament saints longed for our filling and how easily satisfied we are with other things. Jesus, forgive us, continue to convict us and press deeper and deeper this need to be filled by you. Please, God, we cry out with a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that is of you. Father, if there is anyone here today that does not know you, that they are keeping you an arm's length away, I pray that they would hear your call and that they would respond to it, that they would not resist any longer. God, save them. Save them. Holy Spirit, continue to fill us, please, so that you may accomplish all that you desire in us. And we will wait for you. We trust in you, and we will sing and be reminded of your promises and who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.